Hello, welcome to Digital IC Design, EE 423. I am Dr. Mark Narden and will be teaching this course for the next semester at Oregon Tech. The textbook that we will be using for this course is CMOS VLSI Design, the fourth edition, um, a circuit and systems perspective by Neil West and David Harris. Uh, this book is several years old, so uh, you should be able to find used copies. Hopefully it will uh, be a little bit less expensive than some of the brand new uh, textbooks. Um, but even though it's a little bit older, uh, for this, since this is an introduction to CMOS VLSI design, it actually has uh, quite good information and is still accurate for um, the level of design that we're going to be talking about through this course. Uh, as I said uh, in the first slide, I am Dr. Mark Narden. Um, just a little bit of information about me uh, as far as professional information. Um, I got my undergraduate degree in electrical engineering from Michigan Technological University got my master's in electrical engineering from Princeton University and a PhD in electrical engineering with a uh, focus in solid state electronics from the University of Michigan. Um, I've been employed at Intel Corp for about 21 years in Hillsboro, Oregon, and also worked for uh, Intel in Fort Collins, Colorado for about eight years as part of that time. Most of my time um, has been in Oregon though. I've worked on 12 different microprocessor uh, projects and three memory controllers during that time. Uh, all in digital IC design for uh, during that period. I've been employed for two previous years um, at Oregon Tech as an adjunct faculty in Wilsonville, and I've taught E321, E323, and 325, um, both the lecture and lab sections. Uh, in the 2015-2016 school year, I taught lecture sessions for that course, and in 2017-18 year, I taught the <coughs> lab sessions. Uh, as far as professional areas of interest, um, digital and analog circuit design are my main areas. And I also enjoy computer programming of all sorts, but currently I'm interested in ramping up learning in the field of artificial intelligence. So again, I'd like to welcome you to Digital IC Design. It's good to have you here. Um, a quick overview of this course. In this week's lectures, I will be going through the basics of CMOS transistor behavior and fabrication. And then in coming weeks, uh, the lectures will be concentrated over the following topics of advanced, more advanced transistor behavior um, and a little bit more advanced uh, logic than, than the first week and more in the non-idealities of transistors and their behavior. Uh, following that, we'll be going through uh, timing concepts of how the timing of the different gates and logic that you're creating and how uh, we actually store state um, because we do need to have times where we'll, we'll store a value in order to be able to use it for um, some following computation. And then we'll be talking about uh, ALUs, which is a, a arithmet arithmetic logic unit. Uh, so the functions of ALUs, um, such as uh, some of the various different functions can be adders, comparators, shifters, potentially multipliers. Uh, there's lots of different functions that ALUs can do depending on how complex of an ALU you want, you want to create. Then we'll be going into a little bit more advanced fabrication process concerns, um, especially as we've been going forward and getting ever smaller and smaller in the device dimensions. Um, there's been more complications in actually doing the, the fabrication process. And so 
Uh, a lot of what we might be covering in this course uh, might be a little bit different when you get to the most modern process uh, technologies. Uh, the transistors don't look the same and there's uh, the metals might look a little bit different in, in some cases as well um, in order to, to get the small dimensions. Um, following that, we'll be talking about more advanced timing techniques and uh, some concerns with the, the wiring, the actual metal connections, um, especially as you get to, to longer distances, uh, the wiring can actually become a, a pretty noticeable concern. And so what to do about that. Uh, then we'll be going uh, more into um, some techniques for uh, different logical functions that you might want to come up with than the, the standard basic CMOS uh, combinational logic. Um, so how you go about creating your own specialized combinational CMOS gates, um, designing them, and also going into other alternative logic designs, uh, you know, sim such as uh, domino logic, for example. Then, uh, then we'll be going through uh, storing state in arrays. So these are much more um, highly concentrated uh, state storing uh, uh, blocks in your design. Instead of just storing an individual value, you, you store a large array of uh, memory uh, values. So um, a couple examples of arrays are SRAM, uh, register files, ROM, and PLA. Are, and then there's there's others as well. Uh, we'll be mostly concentrating on those, and then uh, wrapping up um, toward the end, uh, talking more about power concerns. Um, I mentioned that uh, in the well. We'll be going through that in more detail in the toward the end of this course. So starting with a brief history of integrated circuit design, um, the first point contact transistor was built in 1947. Uh, John Bardeen and Walter Bretain of Bell Labs uh, designed this and soon after the first actual bipolar junction transistor or BJT uh, as we now uh, discuss it was built. Uh, the first integrated circuit, uh, which we will uh, shorten as IC, was built with two transistors on a single piece of silicon in 1958. Of course, we're much larger than that, many more transistors nowadays, but uh, that was built by Jack Kilby at Texas Inst Instruments. Um, and when I say integrated circuit, you might say, well, it's only two transistors. Well, uh, the tech uh, the term integrated uh, circuit uh, refers to anything more than one transistor on a single piece of silicon. So uh, if you go from two transistors or two billion transistors, we call it an integrated circuit. Um, CMOS usage was started uh, ramping up in the 1960s. Bipolar ju junction transistors generally had a better current drive and better gain than CMOS but CMOS require much less current and power when they're in their idle state and uh, that has become most important um, as we continued along designing transistors on integrated circuits. So nowadays uh, we use mostly CMOS design. This chart is showing how the, uh, the history of scaling as far as transistor count goes on uh, the highest end integrated circuits um, over time from the 1970s to about 2011 is where this chart ends. And you can see I, from looking at this chart, the transistor scaling is about a factor of 2S, 2X, um, the number of transistors on the high, highest end uh, integrated circuits. Um, every two years, you'll, you'll get about 2x the number of transistors. Um, now, since this ends at 2011, I went and looked um, in 2016, uh, the highest, one of the highest end uh, 72 core Intel Xeon Phi 
had approximately 8 billion transistors and um, in today uh, the 32 core AMD EPIC has 19.2 billion transistors so the scaling trend has continued in spite of many challenges as you uh, continue to try and get ever smaller and smaller transistors. So in this chart we see how uh, transistor dimensions have been scaling down over time. Um, this chart, chart starts in the late 1990s and goes through today uh, and tries to predict out into the future. Um, you can see how in 1997 the critical dimension for a transistor was the uh, gate length uh, dimension is shown at 250 nanometers and over time that dimension every two years scales by approximately factor of the square root of two. Um, this corresponds with uh, the previous chart we saw on the number of transistors scaling by a factor of two because if we scale the linear dimension of gate length by square root of two and we can also uh, scale the width by square root of two then the area uh, scales down by a factor of two, um, giving us a increase in no, transistor count factor of two every two years. So um, this this chart follows the the previous chart. Um, it gives a little bit of information as to various different um, things that were done in order to gain that that amount of scaling over time. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of, of the process technology, um, but you can see in uh, 2019 currently we're at dimensions that are approximately 40 to 50 silicon atoms wide. Um, that's because in a silicon crystal structure, um, the distance between two silicon atoms is approximately 0.22 nanometers. And so currently we're in between uh, 10 nanometer and seven nanometer process technologies. And so uh, that gives us 40 to 50 silicon atoms wide. You can see how as we continue to scale down over time in the future, um, they're predicting that this is gonna start tailing off a little bit uh, because as we get closer and closer to the size of individual atoms, obviously bec scaling becomes much, much harder. Um, so we need new ways to continue getting better performance improvements uh, rather than simply scaling the, the size of the transistors. So this chart is showing how clock speed uh, was changing over the uh, history of microprocessors, um, specifically Intel microprocessors. Um, between the early 1970s and mid 2000s. Um, you can see in the early part of this chart from about uh, 1970 through uh, 1995, 96 timeframe, um, processor clock speed was increasing, uh, if you follow the, the line there, at approximately a factor of 10 um, clock speed uh, uh, multiple uh, every 10 years or so. So in approximately 1970, we're at one megahertz clock speed. In the early 1980, 10 megahertz. And early 1990, um, 100 megahertz. Um, you can see right around 1996, uh, that, that started uh, actually increasing by an even faster rate. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you see at the very, toward the end of this chart, um, that it sort of started tailing off and, and even becoming flat to down. Um, so just to, to note, before the year 2000, um, this, this rapid increase in clock speed um, caused a great increase in performance of microprocessors um, year over year. Uh, and you would get that in addition to increased performance by the number of transistors that we talked about in previous. So you were getting very, very large increases in performance through both um, faster processors and more transistors doing more work. Um, 
Now, in 2000, uh, approximately 2001, power consumption concerns actually became uh, very started to dominate. Uh, power is proportional to uh, capacitance that, that you have to drive um, times voltage squared times frequency. Um, our capacitance was increasing due to the increase in transistors. Um, voltage was um, staying flat to down. Uh, they were actually trying to reduce the voltage as we went along in order to help keep power consumption in, in check. Um, and frequency, as frequency was increasing, we were getting much higher power as well. Um, so because our capacitance and frequency kept going up, the only way to try and lower power and keep power in check was to try, trying to lower voltage. But of course, lowering voltage means your transistors themselves aren't quite as fast, which makes it harder to scale frequency. Um, so that's why eventually when we got into the uh, early 2000s, um, the, the frequency scaling kind of came to a, came to a head and, and flattened off. Um, so after the year 2000, uh, most of our performance increases have been coming through increasing the transistors year after year and continuing to do that and not so much from uh, the frequency increases. Um, so as we increase transistors, we can get extra cores, start, you know, that's when we started getting dual core and quad core um, have be, been more and more common as uh, the years have gone on and also getting more specialized hardware functions. Um, just as a slight um, aside here, uh, so I was working at Intel um, starting in 1996 uh, when, when they started doing the even more uh, emphasis on fre frequency and trying to scale that up even even f faster. And I remember after we started doing that, a couple years later um, toward uh, the 1998 time frame, uh, there was uh, one of our, our senior technology people um, in a group that I was in a meeting with uh, was giving a presentation on how this uh, increase in clock speed uh, was going to cause us problems when it comes to power. Uh, and he gave a presentation where he was showing how the power density um, kept increasing so dramatically that if you went back like to the early 1990s, um, he was showing how the scaling in terms of power density and he was showing like a few process generations ago uh, our power density was like um, if you took a flashlight bulb and at the the surface of the bulb that that's about what the power density was and then the next process generation after that it was like a 40 watt bulb instead and how our current microprocessors were the power density of a hot plate and that the next generation would be the power density of like a soldering iron. And then the one after that would be like an Air Force jet engine if you were at, right at the output nozzle of that jet engine when it was on full blast. And then following that would be coming close to the surface of the sun. And so he was, he was kind of giving that presentation as a warning of we can't keep scaling frequency like this. Um, the problem was uh, all the marketing and salespeople and, and you know senior VPs were like, well, people pay for frequency, and so we, we have to keep doing this. Um, and so we were literally, or well, not literally, figuratively um, on this path toward the surface of the sun. Uh, but you know, obviously, physical realities eventually took over, um, and we wound up f finding out not until we were a little bit burned that we couldn't keep scaling frequency like that. And so, so we did hit that power wall um, and you know, eventually reality sunk in, but um, just kind of a warning there, I guess, as technology people, as engineers, um, you have to look at the physical realities and sometimes it might require pushing back against um, people who who 
they're trying to ignore the physical realities but as engineers we have to to keep that in mind um, when we're designing things and not try to please someone who's who's looking to ignore physical realities so just keep that in mind as a cautionary tale and uh, hopefully you know try to de design things with physical realities in mind as you go forward in your careers.